Good. So I guess we can start. A few people kind of getting organized at the back there, but we are getting there. So uh, tonight I um, want to talk about the Buddha and uh, the uh, relationship that we have with the Buddha, what actually the Buddha can mean to us, what uh, he does mean to us, uh, and how we can change that relationship and make it a more powerful one, something that is inspiring and kind of uh, uh, brings us forward on the Buddhist path, uh, and how we can think about the Buddha in a constructive way. Uh. And so this is kind of the idea that Buddha is kind of an awesome figure when you think about him. I think most people have a little bit of sort of, whoa, the Buddha is almost like too much sometimes. There's a kind of power in a sense. Uh, and uh, so it's good, useful to think about the Buddha in a way that is, uh, you know, helpful on the path and doesn't become too, you know, we have a kind of natural almost friendship with the Buddha. Uh, so I want to encourage this friendship with the Buddha and see where that takes us uh, uh, in, on, in this practice. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons I want to talk about this was because I, during the rains retreat at Bodhinyana Monastery, uh, we had a fellow, a man, he came to me kind of every week and I said, please, I need to talk to you. <laughs> and so we had this conversation, maybe, you know, 20 minutes once a week or whatever. Uh, and he was a psychologist and uh, I guess he's used to analyzing everything. Uh, and so he kind of was, we were discussing all aspects of the Dhamma. And sometimes you get some good conversation partners who have good questions. Uh, and one of his questions was, I can understand why we respect the uh, Dhamma, yeah, the teachings, because the teachings are available to us. The Dhamma is here, the word of the Buddha is still preserved after two and a half thousand years, roughly. Uh, and the Sangha is here. Yeah, there still are people who practice really well in the world. Uh, when we talk about the Sangha, we often mean the Arya Sangha, the Noble Sangha, those who practice the path fully. Uh, yeah, and uh, I say that these people still exist in the world to practice in this way. Uh, and so, but what about the Buddha? Yes, Dhamma Sangha, they're right there in front of us. Uh, but the Buddha, he's gone. He's no longer here. Why do we respect someone who is like a historical relic? Uh, someone who is maybe no more than a legend. Uh, someone who is like, it sounds more like mythology sometimes uh, when you hear about the Buddha than it sounds like a real person. Uh, so what is this idea of bowing down to the Buddha? Uh, what does the Buddha got to do with it? Uh, isn't the Dhamma and the Sangha enough? Uh, and that was his argument. And I tried to sort of... Uh, explain to him why the Buddha is important, because the Buddha is like the foundation of everything. Without the Buddha, there is no Dhamma and Sangha and all of these kind of things. And after the conversation, he wasn't very convinced about what I had to say. So I thought, okay, whatever. What can you say? Sometimes you just can't get it right. Yeah? Or maybe the person isn't ready. I don't know what. But sometimes you feel like a failure afterwards. You haven't really kind of succeeded in, in saying what I regard as the bleeding obvious. But I wasn't able to somehow get that across to this person. <laughs> So I thought maybe tonight is my chance, this is my revenge, yeah? and this is kind of today, I'm going to try one more time. And I hope he's out there listening somewhere, and if he's not, I'm going to send him a link to this video when I come back later on, and so he can have a look at this, uh, uh, you know, assuming that this turns out to kind of you know, reasonably persuasive. Yeah? So what is it about the Buddha, yeah? and why does the Buddha matter? Yeah? And the first thing to understand is that the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha as we have them now, uh, yeah, they're very beautiful teachings, uh, and I would really recommend you to have a look at those teachings if you have the opportunity, uh, because they are really powerful and full of really inspiring similes. Uh, I talked about some of those similes last time I was here. Uh, but uh, the Dhamma is really nothing without the Buddha. Uh, yeah? So the very first point, if you are going to respect the Dhamma, and you're going to follow these teachings. Uh, you need to understand that they exist. Uh, they have power. Uh, they have coherence. Uh, they have integrity. Uh, they are something because of the Buddha. Uh, it is the awakening of one person that makes these teachings come together. Uh, there's no other piece of literature in the world that I know of. Uh, and make no mistake, the Buddhist teachings are the most important literature in the history of the world. Uh, it is no, maybe no small claim. Uh, but it's also kind of bleeding obvious when you think about it. Uh, yeah? These are about the very meaning of life, about what, what this existence is all about. Uh. 
And because this literature is such a powerful literature, and because they are very profound and very deep, they only hold together if there are a vision of one personality, one person who sought deeply into the truth and deeply into reality. So the idea that there is a person behind this is actually completely necessary uh, for these teachings to have the power that they have for us, uh, for them to have this kind of uh, sense of being something extraordinary. Uh. And so when we talk about the Buddha, uh, the Buddha is not just any ordinary spiritual teacher. Uh. Yeah, the Buddha is a spiritual teacher who was revolutionary even in his own time. Uh. One of the interesting things about India, India is a very kind of uh, religious country, or I should say maybe spiritual country in many ways. Uh. And it certainly was at the time of the Buddha, two and a half thousand years ago. You read the suttas, you read about all the great variety of spiritual teachers, a great variety of different ideas, some of them really wacky, some of them really interesting. Yeah, nothing has really changed. Wacky and interesting teachings kind of mingling with each other. It was thus then, and it's still the same now. But in India, even more so. And some of these people, they were part of the hegemonic religion, which was, of course, the Brahmanism, or you know, later became Hinduism. Uh, and they did their thing. And then there were more the, what it was called the heterodox people, uh, the wanderers and the ascetics of ancient India, who wander out to find the solution to the answer of life, the meaning of life itself. Uh, and this was India, with this great kind of bowl, this kind of uh, intermingling of all these teachings, uh, all these people seeking for the ultimate purpose, going off into the jungle, going off into the forest, uh, meditating, uh, practicing metta, kindness, friendliness, love, uh, compassion for the whole world. Uh, and of course, in that kind of society, uh, you would expect uh, many people to have very profound insights, uh, very profound understandings. Uh, and indeed, that is exactly what you find in the suttas. Uh, you find all of these ancient people practicing deep meditation, what we call samadhi in Buddhism today, yeah, where the mind kind of comes together, you experience tremendous bliss and tremendous power, a unification, so you feel, you think you are God, yeah? For goodness sake, if you want to be God, that's what you have to do. Yeah? But if you're not satisfied with being God, then you should be a Buddhist. Yeah? God is not good enough, said the Buddha. Yeah, we have to go beyond God. That's essentially what he said. It's kind of fascinating. Yeah. And so you had a spiritual tradition that was very powerful, but even within that spiritual tradition, uh, and I think maybe the world has never ever seen a spiritual tradition quite like they had in India at that time, ever since. Uh, even in that tradition, uh, the Buddha's teaching was revolutionary. Uh, it was beyond what anything else, anyone else had understood. Uh, and of course, that teaching of the Buddha that revolutionized everything uh, was a teaching of non-self. Uh, the idea that there is no inherent essence to a human being. Uh, yeah? And that, of course, that discovery, that insight, that is ultimately the real liberation and the kind, highest kind of happiness that you can have uh, in any kind of human existence. Uh. So because the teaching of the Buddha is so profound, because it is so out of the ordinary, because it's so incredibly rare to find anyone to get there, it is for that reason that actually the Buddha is like the fountainhead, the wellspring of this whole teaching. And from then that Buddha arises these teachings, this Dhamma, this coherent whole, this kind of practice and this path that the Buddha taught. And it's remarkable how coherent these teachings are when you start to read them. And then from that coherence of those teachings, the practice of those, then arises the noble Sangha, the Aryans, the noble people in the world. Because when you practice those teachings, you gain ultimately the same insights as the Buddha. But without the Buddha, this whole system falls apart. Who are these so-called noble beings without the Buddha? They are maybe people with different kind of views, different kind of ideas, yeah? people who don't really have the same kind of uh, go back to the same kind of uh, insight, the same root in a sense. They're just disparate ways of thinking about the world. Uh, yeah? But it's because of the Buddha that this whole thing kind of comes together. Uh, and you can kind of understand uh, uh, that uh, uh, there is a coherence to this whole teaching. Uh. So the Buddha is fundamental. Uh. 
And because the Buddha is fundamental in the suttas, he is said to be like the eye of the world. Uh, yeah, the one who sees for everyone else, everyone else can follow after. Yeah. He is the or originator of everything. Yeah. Yeah, that is why the Buddha matters so enormously. And that is why we should respect the Buddha. Yeah. What happens uh, if we don't take the Buddha as a fundamental teacher? Yeah. And what happens is that instead of the Buddha being your basic teacher, yeah, someone else uh, becomes that basic teacher. Yeah. And if you look around the Buddhist world, this is what you find everywhere around the Buddhist world. Yeah? You ask someone, who is my teacher? They say, oh, my teacher is uh, Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? Okay, good. Don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't have Ajahn Brahm as your teacher. I'm just saying that you know, there is a kind of a hierarchy here, if you like. Or Bhante Gunaratana is my teacher. Ayakema is my teacher. Uh, Master so-and-so is my teacher. Rinpoche so-and-so is my teacher. No one ever says the Buddha is their teacher. Yeah? And that is a grave mistake. Yeah? Because the moment you spread it out in this way, yeah, you get a large variety of views. Many of these views are contradicting each other. Yeah? And you start to get little subgroups, you get little cults. Yeah? And you get sometimes what to me looks definitively like wrong views. Yeah? Things that do not match what the Buddha taught. Yeah? And if it doesn't match what the Buddha taught, well then we have lost the path. Uh, we have lost that connection to the awakening of the Buddha. Uh, we have lost that uh, beautiful possibility uh, of reaching that awakening ourselves. Uh, why? Because we don't take the Buddha seriously enough. Uh. So we need to be very careful with this. Uh, and this is one of the, I think, greatest dangers in always in the Buddhist world. Uh, the spreading out into different views, uh, wrong ideas uh, about what really profound spirituality, what it really means. Uh. So we need to take uh, the Buddha as our teacher. Uh. Yeah, this is kind of one of the first things. Uh. So what does that mean to take the Buddha as your teacher? Uh? Well, it means to be able to relate to the Buddha. Huh? And there's two points I want to make in regard to relating to the Buddha. It is sometimes the problem is that the Buddha seems like slightly alien, yeah, it's slightly different. Uh, I'm not saying he's from a different galaxy, but you know, di different from kind of you know, it's hard to kind of relate to him as a human being. Yeah? So one of the first things that we really need to do is to not to think that just because he existed in India two and a half thousand years ago that he is somehow fundamentally different from us. Yeah, as it, and I don't know about you, <coughs> you, but sometimes when I think about the past and I think about people who lived 10,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago, or you hear about you know, the time of Jesus in the Middle East, or you hear about the Dark Ages in Europe, or, or like the, uh, you know, whatever, whatever place in the world. When you read these history books, it's kind of difficult to fully relate to it, right? It feels like a different time, a different place, as if people somehow were slightly different from us. They weren't really as enlightened as us. They didn't have the same technology. There's something weird about people in the past. I don't know, when you read about the Dark Ages in Europe, it sounds really dark and terrible, right? And you read about other cultures, it sounds like the culture was so different. How can you possibly relate to these things? But I think that is a mistake. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we should maybe learn as human beings uh, is to be able to relate to people uh, who existed in previous historical epochs, 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 mm, uh, how in the same way as we relate to people around us in the present day. Uh, people haven't really changed very much over two and a half thousand years, uh, even if you go back 10,000 years. Uh, Yes, the external environment is different, uh, but psychologically, uh, I say we're largely the same. Uh, if someone dropped you into Europe in the Dark Ages, uh, it probably wouldn't take that long before you feel right at home. Yeah, okay, the material situation is a bit different, but people, I think, are largely the same. Uh, if you put someone like in the Middle East at the time of Jesus, probably you feel at home very quickly. Yeah, you would hang out with whoever and kind of go drinking at the bars and, and whatever and kind of look for relationships <laughs> and all of these kind of things. Uh, and of course, indeed, when you read the suttas uh, and you see how people behaved at that time, they feel like ordinary people. They look like ordinary people. Uh, 
Yeah, they fell in love with each other. Uh, they were on the lookout for relationships. Uh, they went and drank and got drunk. They were angry and yelling at each other. Uh, yeah, they were deluded. But everyone at the same time was looking for happiness and peace and contentment in their life, uh, trying to overcome the negative problems and all the issues that they had. Uh, so when you start to look at how what people were like, you think that could be me. Yeah, two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, and because that could be you in that culture, you realize that the gap that we have now in between ancient India actually is just a figment of our imagination. Really, if we dropped you into that ancient India, you probably fit into that society very quickly. And if you saw the Buddha, you would see the Buddha as just another person in that society. So this is number one in taking away some of the distance between us and the Buddha, understanding that people are just people. We haven't really changed very much on the fundamental psychological level. We're essentially the same kind of people. The other thing to do to take away the psychological distance to the Buddha is to understand that the Buddha was a human being. One of the dangers of being a Buddhist, and especially if you are a traditional Buddhist, is the sense that the Buddha is something different from a human being. Yeah, he's somehow elevated. He's more kind of beyond what it is to be an ordinary human being. Yeah? But uh, that is actually the wrong way of thinking about the Buddha. In fact, it's not just if you are a traditional Buddhist. I must admit, even for me, when I think about the Buddha, it kind of seems really so beyond the ordinary. It's kind of hard to really relate to him as a human in an ordinary way. Yeah? But if you look at how the Buddha describes himself in the suttas, uh, how he describes himself before his awakening and what he was up to, you see that he had all the same things, all the same problems as we have. He was also um, immersed in the human condition. He had the same kind of problems. The Buddha talks about having you know, desires and anger and ill will before his awakening. He talks about attachments to his child and his wife before his awakening. He talks about having wrong views before his awakening. Yeah? All of these things are there. And once you see that, you realize that actually the Buddha-to-be is no different from us. He's just another human being searching for happiness in this world. Of course, the Buddha is more, because the Buddha then takes this very seriously. And he uses that problem of being a Buddha to then move forward, to, use, to do something with that predicament, and then find a solution. And that is the powerful thing about the Buddha, that he has such powerful spiritual qualities that he's able to find a solution to the deepest problems of humanity. And then he reaches awakening. But remember, that awakening too is accessible to each one of us. And because it is accessible to each one of us, again, the Buddha is not fundamentally different from us. And so what does that mean in practice? It all sounds a bit theoretical, but what does it mean in practice? Well, what it means is that if you put yourself into ancient Indian society, you could meet the Buddha. You could sit down and have a chat with him. Yeah. And you could say, oh, venerable when well, please, I have a question or whatever. Yeah, can you? Would you please mind answering? Oh, I need to go on a diet. Can you give me a diet, please? Uh, and he will give you a diet. And he will say, "Do this," and then you kind of you lose a few kilos. Uh, actually, this may sound like a joke, but actually, there is a sutta where he does precisely that. Uh, so it's not not a joke. Yeah, the Buddha is very practical. He gives you all kinds of advice, from the most ordinary to the most profound. Uh, this is kind of the interesting thing, yeah? There's a human relationship with the Buddha in a much more ordinary way than you might think. Yeah? So you meet the Buddha, yeah? Isn't that kind of cool? He's an ordinary human being. You can speak with him just like you can speak with Ajahn Brahm. Or are you someone here afraid of speaking with Ajahn Brahm? Sometimes people are afraid of Ajahn Brahm. They go, oh, Ajahn Brahm, too much, and they kind of sneak out the back door. But Ajahn Brahm is not dangerous, right? So kind of next time he's here, have a chat with Ajahn Brahm. The Buddha is a bit like Ajahn Brahm, but even more Ajahn Brahm than Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> yeah? More metta, more peace, more of everything. Yeah? yeah, this is kind of the Buddha. He's kind of the highest elevation of these things. Yeah? And so this is kind of where you start to understand that the Buddha, you can actually relate to the Buddha as a human being. Yeah? So again, what does this mean in practice? And I will give you a very practical uh, way, uh, uh, 
or a consequence of looking at the Buddha in this way. Yeah. Now, one of the very important teachings of Buddhism is the teaching of rebirth. Yeah, because rebirth is very fundamental because that is really when you start to understand the big picture of suffering in the world. So when we talk about awakening in Buddhism, it's really about the ending of rebirth. Yeah, so how does this relate to the Buddha? And this is what I want to come down to now. And the way this relates to the Buddha, well, well People often ask, and this is, of course, a very important question, well, what is the evidence for rebirth? Uh, I have grown up in a situation, in a culture, where believing in rebirth is not really considered you know, right, and rebirth is considered a superstition, and all of these kind of things, so I need some evidence, please, before I can believe in this. Uh, and there is a lot of really good evidence for rebirth available these days. Uh, lots of people who do a, you know, all kinds of research about the nature of the mind, about near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences and terminal lucidity experiences. Uh, these are people getting lucid just as they're about to die, which really contravenes all the medical knowledge, but still it seems to happen. Uh, uh, and there's people who remember past lives, and there's actually a vast literature, and some of it is actually very good science. Uh, so all of this yeah, is kind of evidence for the idea of rebirth. Uh, so what then is the best evidence for rebirth? If there's all of this evidence, is there one piece of evidence that really stands out? Uh, and I say yes. Uh, there's one piece of evidence, a lot of the evidence I just talked about is really, really interesting, and some of it to me is kind of, you know, I, I think that is really sufficient. But is there one piece of evidence more powerful than any other evidence? And I say, yes, there is. What is that piece of evidence? And it is none of those things I just talked about. The most powerful piece of evidence that there is rebirth is simply the fact that the Buddha said so. That is the most important piece of evidence, as far as I'm concerned. Of course, if you say that in the wrong company, people think you are a religious nut. Maybe I am a religious nut. Yeah, please tell me if I am afterwards, because you, can't, you don't know yourself, right? Only other people on the outside can know. So if I'm, Ill, if I'm a religious nut, please let me know. But uh, I don't think so. And I will tell you why this is the most powerful piece of evidence. And the reason is because the Buddha is our teacher. The Buddha is an ordinary human being, yeah? and the Buddha is giving you a teaching, yeah? right? If you go to school, uh, if you have a teacher who tells you something at school, A, you know, Napoleon, whatever, won, lost the Battle of Waterloo, or the Second World War, or, uh, you know, Australia was bombed by the Japanese during the Second World War, it was, right? Darwin or something like that, yeah? I, my, my knowledge of Australian history is a little bit lacking, unfortunately. Yeah? But there are these things we learn at school. And then when we learn these things at school, we, take to, we tend to take them on board, right? Why do we take them on board? Well, because we have no reason to think that the teacher is lying to us, right? So we take them on board on faith, because the teacher says so. But this is an ordinary teacher. An ordinary teacher can make mistakes. The textbook may be biased in a certain way. All textbooks, by definition, are going to be biased in a certain way. That's just the nature of thought, the nature of ideas. So these are ordinary teachers. But then comes the Buddha. The Buddha is like the teacher with the highest kind of integrity. The Buddha is the teacher with the deepest insight into the nature of existence. That's what he claims to be in the suttas. If he says that there is a rebirth, we should take that far more seriously than an ordinary teacher telling us about the Second World War or whatever. The Second World War may never have happened, but rebirth must still be true. What do you reckon? <laughs> Why? And the reason is because here is the most powerful teacher in the world. Here is someone who we can rely on more than anything else. The only reason why we don't take that seriously is because the Buddha is somehow removed from us. Yeah? In time, in culture. And for that reason, we think that there is a distance. But no, the Buddha is a teacher like anyone else. And that is why we should take that seriously. The Buddha said there is rebirth must mean, to my mind, we should take that extremely seriously, probably more seriously than one plus one is two. So there you are. This is how the idea of the Buddha, taking the Buddha as your teacher, changes the way you think about certain things. You take them far more seriously as a consequence. 
So how can we approach the Buddha even more? How can we understand this person even more? Uh, I want to give you a few more ideas of how to approach the Buddha so you get some idea who this person actually is. So you can relate to the Buddha as a teacher in this way. Uh. Now one of the beautiful things about the Buddha is that uh, you can kind of summarize uh, his personal qualities in two things. Uh. There's two things that the Buddha, Buddha had many, many remarkable personal qualities when you, if you take what the Sutta says seriously, but in a, in a sense you can actually summarize all these qualities in two kind of overarching qualities, uh, two qualities that in a sense motivated his entire existence. Uh, and this is the Buddha's wisdom uh, and the Buddha's compassion. Uh, yeah, the Buddha knew that he understood the human, exist, the human condition. Uh, he knew what it means to be a human being. Uh, he knew that he had a solution to the problems of being a human being. And he, because he had that solution, and he knew what was going on, compassion arose in the Buddha. He wanted to help the world because he knew he could help out. So the Buddha has these two qualities, compassion and wisdom. That is why he helps the world. But the Buddha doesn't really want to help anyone for any other reason. The Buddha doesn't want to have disciples. The Buddha doesn't want to have any material gain out of being a teacher. Actually, the Buddha would rather just stay in a cave and meditate, right? And get rid of all these people kind of flocking around and talking too much. Yeah. And, but still, even though it was a negative, it had a negative effect on the Buddha to teach, still he taught out of compassion because he had the answer to the deepest problems of human existence. And so what that means is that when the Buddha teaches, uh, because he teaches without any vested interest, he teaches purely out of compassion, uh, everything he says is very pure. Yeah? If you have a vested interest, it's going to be tainted by that vested interest. Uh, maybe you get a salary. Yeah? Maybe someone kind of becomes your disciple and you think that's cool. Uh, or maybe you get something out of state or something out of the idea of being a teacher. Yeah? Whenever there's a vested interest, there will be a slight distortion in the teachings because that vested interest by nature will have an effect on how you teach. Yeah. But the Buddha, there is no vested interest. In fact, there is a negative vested interest because he would rather be by himself. And so his teachings are purely driven by compassion and kindness. There is no other motivating force. And so when you come to the teachings of the Buddha, don't reject them too easily. Remember, some, here is someone who is just teaching for your benefit, for no other reason whatsoever, only for your benefit, uh, even, is, even if it is to his own disadvantage. Uh. And so when you read the teachings, read, look at that compassion in the teachings. Uh. Remember, that is why they are there. Uh. Ask yourself, what is he trying to tell me here? What is this message really about? Uh. And then you are reading the suttas, uh, the word of the Buddha, with the right kind of attitude. Uh, you're making the Buddha your teacher in a very personal, in a very powerful way. Uh, because you understand why he's teaching you, where he's coming from. Uh, it's from a very pure place. Uh. So this is the first thing I would like to say. Uh. And the second thing, and I've talked about some of these things before, uh, but I think they are really important to making that connection with the Buddha. So I want to say them again. Uh. And the other thing, the other point I want to make yeah, is that uh, we are, in a sense, immediate, very direct disciples of the Buddha. Yeah. Again, it feels like the distance between us and the Buddha is so large because of time and because of culture and all of these kind of things. Yeah. But actually, from the Buddha's point of view, yeah, we are actually his disciples yeah, if we are interested in his teachings. Yeah. And the reason for that is because when the Buddha taught his teachings uh, two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, one of the things that he said, uh, he said that uh, I'm setting, when I teach these teachings, uh, I'm setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. Uh, the wheel of the Dhamma is the power of these teachings. Uh, these teachings have a certain power because when you teach them, uh, another person practices them, uh, and when they practice them, they get certain results which are accord with those teachings, uh, and eventually they too become enlightened. Eventually they too see what the Buddha saw. Yeah? And in this way, the Dhamma, wheel of Dhamma rolls on from one generation to the next one, from teacher to disciple, on and on, from one era to another era, from one culture to another culture. Uh, 
And the Buddha said at the very beginning that he is setting in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. He knew that there would be people in the future listening to these teachings. This was part of his game plan from the very beginning because he understood the power of these teachings to roll on in the world. And because he knew that, yeah, because he was aware of that at the very beginning, yeah, he gave, when he gave a teaching, yeah, it wasn't just to the people in front of him, yeah, it was having all the people in the future also in mind. Yeah, people around the world in different cultures, yeah, people here in Perth at Amaloka Center, yeah, people anywhere, yeah. yeah. We are all his disciples in the sense that he thought of the entirety of humanity when he gave his teachings. So the Buddha thought of you when he gave these teachings. You were in his mind. Isn't that kind of powerful? Isn't that kind of amazing? If you get that, if you understand what that means, it means that when he gave his teachings, he didn't really teach in a way that typical religious people do and they draw a lot on the local culture. Uh, yeah, if you read some of these ancient uh, scriptures, you kind of feel that you get drawn into this ancient culture in a different time and place. It can be difficult to relate to sometimes. Uh, but when you come to the teachings of the Buddha, they kind of elevate it out of the local culture uh, and they speak more of what I would call a universal language. Uh, a language of the human heart, a language of human psychology. The Buddha tells you, be kind. Speak kind words to other people around you. Speak words that go to the heart. Haddaya gamma, go to the heart. They are exactly the same terminology that we have in the present day. The language is the same. The language has this universal aspect to it. Don't speak divisive speech. Speak speech, speech of harmony. Samagga, samaggi is the idea, the word of harmony in Buddhism. Yeah? Or in Indian languages. The same ideas that we have now. If you look at the Buddhist ideas of morality, they match very, very well on with the ideas of morality in the present day. Except that they take it a little bit further. Yeah, the Buddha spoke this beautiful universal language of the mind. And when we meditate in the present day, and you read the suttas, and the Buddha tells you these are the qualities you will achieve in meditation, lo and behold, you achieve exactly those qualities. The peace, the bliss, the unity of mind, the power of mindfulness, the energy that comes up behind that, the ability to see clearly. This is why meditation is so powerful. All of those things are right there. And then one day, if you carry on with this path, you gain the same insight as the Buddha. You gain the insight into the emptiness of all phenomena, the insight into non-self. And at that point, you understand for the first time in your life, 100% who the Buddha was. Because you understand that only a person who had the same insight would, was, would, would have been able to teach these precise teachings. And then you know the Buddha existed. And then you bow down to the Buddha. And your eyes are filled with tears because of the power of the bliss, the powerful of understanding. Sometimes you hear about people, this is kind of really extraordinary. They bow down to someone or to the Buddha statue and they just cry. Why? Because they understand the power of what is going on. So the Buddha is your teacher. The Buddha thought about you. Yeah. So when you read the suttas, the Buddha is talking to you. Yeah, to me, to every one of us. He's not talking to just a crowd in front of him two and a half thousand years ago. And when you read them with the idea that the Buddha is talking to you, and he's talking to you out of compassion because he understands your human predicament, coming from the most profound wisdom it is possible to have about the human condition, all of those things coming together, it becomes incredibly powerful. It's like, wow, I have to read these things with great care. You linger on every word. You think, what does this word actually mean? What does it mean in my life? How does it relate to my, my existence? These things are not just theories. These are not just things to think about. These are things to Take into your life and understand, coming from your perspective about your life. And then it becomes truly transforming. Slowly, 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 you become a different person. I don't know about you, I think many of you will have seen that in your life already. 
I have certainly seen it in myself, uh, how over time you gradually change. Uh, and then this process happens. Uh. And so then, uh, when you do this, you want to bow down to the Buddha in a new way, because you understand the Buddha actually is your teacher in a very powerful sense. Uh. And I sometimes recommend people to take this idea of bowing down to the Buddha and actually contemplate that a little bit. Imagine what it actually might be like to meet the Buddha. Yeah, imagine traveling to India. I will be going to India later on this year, going to the holy places. It will be in December. And uh, that will be very interesting, yeah? And you kind of look around, you wonder, oh, maybe the Buddha is still around here somewhere. You're kind of looking. Because you go to the places where the Buddha was, right? Going to India is like an eye-opener. You go to these places, you recognize them because the artists look exactly the way they are described in the suttas. It's kind of extraordinary. So you're kind of looking, you wonder, maybe the Buddha is still around somewhere. Actually, that's kind of superstitious. Yeah, he would have been two and a half thousand years old. I'm not sure if you wouldn't want to meet a person who's two and a half thousand years old. It might not be very pretty sight anymore. Even the Buddha might not actually kind of age that well. Huh? So, uh, but uh, it's still powerful in a certain way. Yeah? So you can imagine yourself yeah, being there two and a half thousand years ago. Huh? Or maybe going out into the Australian bush somewhere yeah, and actually meeting the Buddha. Huh? Yeah? Or you hear that the Buddha is in such and such a forest. Huh? And you think, okay, if the Buddha is here, cheapest, I've been reading his word, I, I better go and see him if he's in this forest. Uh, this might be interesting, yeah, to see the Buddha. Huh? I should go and see him, I should take this opportunity. Yeah. And so you start walking into the forest. Uh, and of course, as you walk into the forest, uh, and because you know it is the Buddha there, uh, how would you feel? Uh, a little bit nervous, perhaps? Uh, a little bit apprehensive? Uh, this is a person with a massive reputation. This is a person, the greatest spiritual master in human history, head and shoulders above everyone else. That's what I say, but I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Buddhist, of course. But anyway, that's kind of what I say. Yeah, he really is special because of his insight into non-self. And now you're going to approach the greatest spiritual master in human history. Guaranteed he can read your mind. Yeah? Are you ready to have your mind read? It's actually, it's not really, it's not really scary. Yeah, I, the, I have had a couple of situations where I've been pretty sure my mind was kind of being, uh, kind of clearly, clearly read. Do you want to hear about that? Huh? <laughs> this is a bit of a sidetrack. Like I, I, I'll talk about. I'll, I'll just give you an idea what happens. This is kind of an extraordinary thing. Yeah, and. Um, I'm not going to say who it is or in a situation, but I was in Thailand. I visited a monk in Thailand, a very kind of a well-known monk, and he's this extraordinary monk with powerful, powerful metta and very peaceful and always very kind. And uh, so I came to his monastery, and I, when I came to his monastery, I was quite a senior monk already, and he kind of put me on this big chair next to him, right? And there was a large group of lay people around, always lots of lay people around. They wanted to like, bathe in his kind of kindness and these kind of things. So we were sitting there, and he was talking to all these people. Yeah? And so as he was talking to all these people, I was looking at him. Yeah? <laughs> and when I looked at him, I thought to myself, well, you know, you're getting old, Ajangana. You're getting pretty ugly, actually. And I was feeling a bit bad. This is not a very respectful thing to, <laughs> to think, right? But then I thought, even though you're getting old and a little bit ugly, your beauty is still there because your spiritual qualities are so powerful that the beauty kind of shines through yeah, the, sup the superficial kind of signs of aging. Yeah. And then when I had said that, uh, he turns, and he tur doesn't turn to me here, he turns to this old lady here, who's sitting on the opposite side, uh, and he says to this old lady, well, even though you're getting old and maybe a bit ugly, uh, you can still be beautiful if you practice the spiritual qualities. Uh. <laughs> and I thought, what? <laughs> and I thought, this is just too good to be true, you can't possibly be right. So afterwards I went to his kind of attendant and I asked him, well, does he say this to everybody? Yeah, you can be beautiful even though you're old. And he said, I never heard him say this before. That's what the attendant said. Uh. <laughs> And then I kind of felt, this is, this is really strange, this is, I felt a bit self-conscious at that moment, I have to admit. And, uh, but then uh, I also felt that ease, yeah. And this is kind of the, re the weird thing when you are with somebody who has so much kindness, uh, 
so much metta, so much compassion for you. Uh, you never really feel kind of threatened by that. Yeah? And I knew at that time, even if I thought of murdering him, uh, he would still have metta towards me. Yeah? This is the beauty of people like that. Uh. So as you approach the Buddha, remember that. Yeah? It is not really dangerous, even if he reads your mind, uh, even if you feel you're not ready to have your mind read, uh, even if you think you're going to murder the Buddha, because when someone says, don't think of a white elephant, well, you think of it straight away. Don't think about murder, and the kind of murder comes into your mind. Yeah? You can't stop yourself. Uh. This is how the mind works. Uh. But anyway, you know, so you, start, you, you, kind of, you are okay with it. Uh. And so you start approaching the Buddha. Uh. You feel apprehensive. Uh. You feel a bit scared, a little bit anxious about what's going to happen. Uh, this is this extraordinary person that you've heard about. Uh, but then as you come into the presence of the Buddha, uh, as you approach him, uh, you can start to see him in the distance. Uh, he's sitting at the root of a tree. Uh, you start to feel the peace around this person. Uh, you start to feel the aura that spreads out far beyond this person. Uh, and because the aura is so powerful, because the peace is so tangible, uh, you start to calm down. Uh, you start to lose that sense of apprehension. Uh, you're approaching, you start to understand that you're actually reaching something really special uh, when you come into the presence of the Buddha. Uh, and so you approach the Buddha more. Uh, you come closer and closer. Uh, you start to see him. Uh, he looks pretty much like an ordinary monk. Uh, yeah, you can imagine the Buddha lived in India. He's basically like an Indian man, yeah, with robes, not quite like this, but something like this. He has a shaven head. He sits at the root of a tree. Everything is very simple. Everything is very ordinary. But there's something about the aura around him that makes you start. You start to become really peaceful. And so you go up to the Buddha, all the way up. And because you start to feel really peaceful, uh, you start to feel at ease. Uh, still a little bit nervous perhaps, but starting to feel at ease. Uh, and the Buddha has noticed that you are there, uh, so he looks at you. Uh, and so he asks, uh, why have you come? And then uh, you say, oh, I'm you know, having some relationship problems. <laughs> Right? This is why people came to the Buddha, even in those days. I can tell you, as a monk, uh, these are the kind of questions you get all the time, right? Relationship problem, problems with my children, problems with my work, all these kind of things. These are standard things. The Buddha, of course, also got those things. But of course, you feel a bit sheepish, yeah? You come to the greatest spiritual master of the universe. Maybe not the universe, but you know what I mean. Uh, and then you ask about your relationship. You feel a little bit kind of, maybe I should ask about something else, but I don't know what to ask, so what am I going to do? And so the Buddha says, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, first of all, take a seat. Uh, so you sit down. Uh, yeah, the Buddha always kind of looks after you. He has compassion for you. Uh, and then the Buddha says to you, with so much kindness, uh, with so much care, uh, yeah, okay, you have a relationship problem. Uh, remember compassion. Uh, no one in the world is perfect. Uh, everyone has their problems. Uh, yeah, have compassion for your partner. Have compassion for the other person in your life. Uh, yeah, and as you have compassion for them, as you understand that they bring their own baggage into this world, uh, they have their own problems to deal with, uh, yeah, of course, uh, because of their conditioning, it's going to be difficult sometimes. Uh. And so the Buddha's answer is so simple. Uh. It is so straightforward. Uh. And of course, you knew all of these things already before the Buddha opens his mouth. Uh. But there's something about the way the Buddha says these things, uh, that allows the simple teaching uh, to sink in in a deeper way than it has ever before. Uh. And for the first time in your life, you really believe these things in a fundamental way because of the way that the message is spoken. Uh. There's the sense that the Buddha has your well-being at heart. Uh. The Buddha doesn't really care about anything else but your well-being at that moment. Uh. And he says these things for your benefit. Uh. And then when you feel all of this kindness, uh, the very simple teaching, nothing really fancy here. You start to feel a lot very inspired by this. And all you want to do is bow down to this person because you understand the profundity of some of the spiritual qualities that this person has. You see something unique, you understand, you touch something that is very difficult to touch in this world. You've seen something very special. There's no sense of ego there. There's no real person behind this. All there is is this 
coming together of very powerful spiritual qualities, wisdom, compassion, understanding, kindness, peace, all coming together in this one person. And of course, these are the things you want to bow down to. So when you bow down to the Buddha, the reason you are inspired, the reason you want to do this is because of those qualities and not because of the Buddha as a person. Or rather, this is what the person of the Buddha actually is. So it becomes very beautiful, and so you bow down. And when you bow down to the Buddha, maybe you have some tears in your eyes, because you understand that from now on, your life is going to take a different direction. This is going to be one of those positive traumas. It's going to be one of those things that you will never be able to forget in your life. You have been in the presence of something really extraordinary. Then you get up, and you start walking away. And what you carry with you as you're walking away is this extraordinary feeling of your life having been changed once and for all. You can never turn back. You have touched something very profound and something very beautiful. And so you go back, and even though the teaching that the Buddha gave you was very ordinary, because it was given by the Buddha, you put it into practice in your daily life. And the results start to happen as a consequence. And when the results start to happen as a consequence, you get even more confidence in these teachings. Maybe you go back to the Buddha later on, and the snowball starts to roll. And eventually, one day, you too become the heir of those teachings. So this is the way to think about the Buddha. This is the way to make these teachings come alive. When you read the suttas, when you hear the word of the Buddha, think about it in this way. When you bow down to the Buddha here in this hall, it is an opportunity to remember those powerful qualities of this person who existed two and a half thousand years ago. Don't waste the opportunity of bowing. The opportunity of bowing is an opportunity to allow those same qualities to grow inside of you. Because if you respect these qualities so much that you are willing to bow down to them, it means that very respect will allow those qualities to grow in you in the future. So it's a beautiful thing to bow down. It's a very powerful thing. It lessens the sense of self a little bit, lessens the sense of ego, and allows something much more beautiful to come out in its place. The ego is such a big problem because it blocks very often the spiritual path. And if we can let go of the ego a little bit, so much the better for ourselves and also for the people around us. So this is how to think about the Buddha. And this is how to make the Buddha a real teacher in your life, a real human being, somebody you can respect in a real way. And understanding that the Buddhism as we have it today exists because of the Buddha. Without the Buddha, there would be no Dhamma, there would be no Aryas, there would be no spiritual path, there wouldn't be anything. The Buddha is like the fountainhead from which everything else springs. The Buddha is fundamental to our spiritual well-being and our spiritual path. So please take this with you and see if you can make that relationship with the Buddha work in your life. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So now is a chance to ask questions or make any comments if you have any. Please fire away if you wish. Maybe I should stop using the metaphor of firing away because uh, f if you're going to fi fire some compassion uh, or something good. Uh. Thank you, Ajahn. I was going to um, relay a story when we went on pilgrimage okay. to India. Ajahn Yanadamu recollected how he was uh, the town caller at the time of the Buddha, and he would go from village to village, saying that the Buddha is going to follow in another day or two. The, the, sorry, the Buddha what? That Buddha would come to that village in another ah, day okay. or two. Ah, right. yeah. okay, all right, yeah, okay. So that was his, um, yeah. his job. Yeah. So obviously he re recollected that. 
So I would like to think that at the time of the Buddha, we might have seen him or met him or heard from him. <laughs> yeah. So all these yeah. 2,500 years, we are interested in his teachings. Mm. Because maybe we didn't hear, we heard it, but we didn't get it at that time. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's kind of a, yeah. That's I think that's a common experience. I've heard many people say similar kind of things. You know, they they think they were around the time of the Buddha, but they were too busy doing other stuff. They forgot to listen properly to the teachings. So, yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Imagine thinking back. Imagine the regret when you die. Yeah. Wow. You had these things available right in front of you, and you didn't take it. I was probably one of those. <laughs> It's kind of a scary thought, but this is, the, uh, this is what happens. We don't understand what we have. Uh, and if we understand what we have now, we put forward what enormous amount of effort right now because we still have those teachings. So, yeah? And this is kind of the wonderful thing about this. Uh. All right, anyone else? Uh? Ajahn Brahmali. Yeah, um, please. You yeah. said earlier there's a sutta about dieting by the Buddha. Can you tell us about that sutta, please? Uh, about the what? Dieting. We're going on a diet. Ah, <laughs> the dieting. Okay. Do you want to do some weight, uh, Moon? Is that the idea? Or are you <laughs> there are some very cute suttas. Yeah? This is like a cute sutta. <laughs> very sweet sutta. This is the... Uh, because Buddha had some very close personal relationships with certain people. Yeah? Because some people were very close disciples of the Buddha. And one of the people who was the closest disciple of Buddha was King Pasenadi of Kosala, one of the great kings of ancient India. Yeah, he, had, he came to the Buddha all the time. There's a whole 25 suttas together in one chapter, all discussions between the Buddha and this king. Yeah? And one of the suttas is precisely about this. The, Buddha, the king comes to the Buddha one day, he's huffing and puffing, he's a bit kind of over, he's overweight, right? And the, the Buddha says to him, oh, yeah, you mean, you know, why are you huffing and puffing so much? Oh, I think I've eaten too much. Uh, okay, I'll teach you how to lose weight. Yeah? <laughs> and then the Buddha gives him this verse. Yeah? And this verse, I can't even remember it. I'm really embarrassed about that, but I can't remember that verse. I think it's because it's not kind of, uh, kind of core Dhamma. That's why I can't remember it. <laughs> Probably one reason. It's a nice excuse anyway. Uh, but essentially, he tells him that, uh, you know, the verse about uh, you know not to eat too much, basically, uh, be mindful while you're eating, so you stop at the right time. That thing he tells him this verse, and then he has the king recite it, and then he says to the king, "Okay, when you go back to your kind of your palace or whatever, or your house, didn't really have palaces, a large house, uh, uh, tell your kind of your um, one of your servants yeah, to recite this verse every day while you are eating." Yeah, <laughs> this is the diet thing. So what you should do, you should kind of record some kind of message to yourself, yeah, okay, must not eat too much, be mindful, yeah, feel the tummy, is it full already, yeah, okay, f and record and play it while you're eating, that's kind of the way to go, I think, yeah. But um, it's f this sutta is found in the uh, connected discourse of the Buddha, Sangyutta Nikaya, Kosala Sangyutta, the third Sangyutta, I think it's sutta number 17, so go there and you can read it for yourself, uh, and if you can't find it, Moon, you're always welcome to approach me, yeah. <laughs> You have repaired the windows at the monk's court. So out of gratitude for your beautiful repair over there, I will repay that by showing you that sutta. It was very nice, I have to say. It's kind of beautiful to see the care that people sometimes put into things. I, just as I was coming out of the door of the monk's quarters, uh, the path, everything was beautifully swept. Yeah? Sometimes it hasn't been swept, and you walk there barefoot, and it's kind of really painful. Today it was beautifully swept. Uh, and it's kind of nice to see that when you see the care that people put into things. Yeah, someone repairs your windows. Uh, the beautiful thing about working together in a Buddhist society like this, uh, everyone doing their little part. Uh, there's something beautiful about that harmony of uh, that we can have together in this way. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, lucky over here. So, oh, Eddie, Eddie, you you will always uh, you will get a chance. Uh, yeah. So we'll get back to you here. Yeah. Ajahn, we always hear that uh, Jesus once went in search of Buddha's teachings. It was very recently said in a BBC documentary. So I just want to know what your comments are about it, Ajahn. Um, don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I, I have my doubts, to be honest. Uh, I, I'm not so sh sure about that. I know some people say this. Uh, I, 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 it's hard to know. I mean, you have to study these things in depth to really be able to evaluate these things properly. Uh, 
but it sounds sounds to me too uh, too good to be true. <laughs> it sounds like we are Buddhists. We want to believe this kind of thing. That's kind of what it sounds to me a little bit. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, Eddie, your turn. Yeah. Oh, Ajahn Brahmali. Yeah. Very good talk, Ajahn Brahmali. Yeah. Ajahn Brahmali, there's no doubt that the Buddha's teaching is true, you know. Yeah. Do, Ajahn Brahmali, don't you think over the years, you know, over the 2,500 over years, you know, the Buddha's teaching has been distorted, you know, especially, you know, um, with the circular Buddhists, you know. Yeah, the circular Buddhists. Yeah, the Buddhists they had their own. Ah. You know, this, it just taught the thing. Okay, yeah. the only thing we should be referring more towards the sutta, mm-hmm. no? because that's original thing. Okay, yeah. and then if we want to go for Buddhism, mm-hmm. we should be going to a a a, 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 a reputable temple, you know, <laughs> instead of all those. You, yeah, you see, they, yeah. and they are very, yeah. very distorted, and yeah. they get confused, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, outside, if you see yeah. like a discussion with people, mm. it could be confusing too, mm. you know, mm. because there's all sorts of ideas that come out for, for Buddhism. Mm. Do, do you notice that, Ajahn Brahmali? Yes. And uh, mm. absolutely, I think that is a very important point. And this mm. is one of the reasons why what we teach here at the BSWA is what mm. we call the early Buddhist texts, yeah, the early Buddhist teachings, mm. uh, precisely because you, want, you understand that uh, over the centuries, over the millennia, that uh. there has been a lot of moving in different directions, new texts have been written, mm. new kind of suttas have arisen, and all vast number of different schools, sometimes not compatible with each other, have mm. arisen. And so we need to kind of come back to the thing that unifies all Buddhists, really. Mm. And mm. this is one of the beautiful things about yeah. going back to the early Buddhist texts. They have that also in Everywhere in the world, they have these texts to some extent. If you go to the Mahayana Buddhist countries, they also have these texts. Yeah? Mm. And so we have something we can unify, unify around. Mm. And that is kind of part, part of the advantage of going back to this earliest text. Uh. Yeah. In fact, yeah. Ajahn Brahmi, you remember no, they had the, after the passing the Buddha, yeah. they had the, you know, the first, what, con, what conference, second, you know? Councils, yeah. yeah council, yeah. Yeah. they've already formulated the things in it. Mm. Mm. You know, no? Yep. And can I just one more? Thing? Yeah, uh, just just yeah. quickly. Yeah. The Buddha was saying that uh, that's what I understand from scriptures mm. that not many people can understand his teaching. Mm. You know? mm. Only those who people who's got some little wisdom. The thing, because you know, because his teaching is very deep can really grasp his teaching. Yeah, you know? yeah, what yeah. do you think of that? Okay. Yeah, you, well, you have to be interested in the teachings. So everyone here has the opportunity because everyone here is already interested. Yeah. Thank All right. So let's uh, have a quick look at the uh, questions from outside the center. Yeah. So we have one from Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. Can you give examples of some of the suttas which give you the most sense of personal connection to the Buddha? Um, okay, so some of the suttas uh, uh, is where we kind of see the Buddha yeah, and how he kind of deals with the people around him. And uh, as I mentioned, the suttas where he speaks to King Pasenadi are those. Yeah? They have like a personal relationship almost. They talk a bit back and forth. You know, one example, which is also quite nice, is an example where uh, King Pasenadi is a queen. She has just given birth to a daughter. And the king is distraught. Yeah? He goes, oh no, my queen has given birth to a daughter. I wanted a son. Yeah? This is ancient India. They wanted sons all the time. Yeah? And then the Buddha tells him that daughters can be just as good as sons, right? Uh, that's kind of very beautiful teaching. Uh, and it also says something about the Buddha that he didn't kind of, he saw people for their qualities rather than for the gender, which is kind of uh, interesting from that perspective as well. Uh. And uh, then there are uh, the suttas of the Majjhimanikaya, the middle length sayings of the Buddha, where you see the Buddha interacting with people all kinds of people in society, yeah, how he treats them with kindness and care and with understanding, how he delivers a suitable teaching to them, yeah. There is some in the Vinaya Pitaka, the Vinaya Pitaka is the rules for the monastics, uh, has some beautiful teachings in there about how the pe- Buddha kind of walks around uh, the monastery and he looks at the monks and sees what they're doing. Uh, and in one place he sees a monk, he's mending his robe, he's using a needle and mending his robes. Uh, and the Buddha praises him. Yeah, it is good that you're mending your robe in this way. Yeah. It makes the robe last longer. Yeah. Or another place where the Buddha sees a very famous 
part of the Vinaya Pitaka, where the Buddha sees a sick monk. This monk is really sick. He has dysentery. He's filthy. Yeah, dysentery. Everything just comes out of your body. You become really disgusting. Yeah? And the Buddha, together with Venerable Ananda, clean up the monk. Yeah? It's kind of extraordinary. Yeah? It gives a sense of human-to-human -human interaction uh, between the Buddha and his disciples and the people around him. Uh. There's actually a lot like that. I would recommend you to read re the Majjhima the middling sayings of the Buddha are great, uh, but also some of the suttas in the, uh, as I mentioned just, just before. Uh. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So we have uh, from Gloria Wong. Hello, Gloria. Uh, I sometimes feel hard to view the Buddha as a normal person. Is it because of descriptions of his psychic powers or being able to see from very far away? Do you have any comment on that? Uh, yes, I, I know what you mean. It can be difficult to see the Buddha as an, uh, an ordinary person, especially because sometimes we have been kind of socialized to think about the Buddha in a certain way. Uh, but uh, try to think of the Buddha before his awakening, yeah? Read some of the suttas that talk about the Buddha before his awakening. Majjhima Nikaya 26, middle length number 26, uh, the noble search. Uh, mid ma middle length sayings number 4, fear and dread sutta. Uh, middle length sayings 36, uh, the longer sutta to Satchaka. Middle length sayings number 85, yeah, the... Uh, what is it called again? Bodhi Raja Kumara Sutta. Yeah? All of these suttas where the Buddha talks about his life before his awakening, yeah? you get the sense of who he was. Yeah? And then you, what you see is an ordinary human being. Yeah? And then that ordinary human being perfecting themselves through this practice. Yeah? And remember that if the Buddha had certain powers, those powers are available to us too, yeah. In principle, they're available to everyone. These are just ordinary human powers. There's nothing miraculous about them. They're not outside of normal reality. They are super normal rather than supernatural. Yeah. And then we have a, a question from Richard Vezaga. I apologize if I haven't pronounced that name correctly. From Bolivia. So, hello, Richard. Uh, what is Yonesomanasikara or wise attention? Uh, could you give some examples, please? Uh, and why is the antidote against the hindrance of doubt and also against delusion itself? Uh, um, so that is a big topic, uh, Yonesomanasikara. Yonesomanasikara, wise attention, basically means that you attend in such a way that your bad qualities go down and your good qualities increase. Uh, so when you look at someone uh, and you see them with uh, compassion and understanding and friendliness and these good things, uh, then uh, your good qualities are going up. Uh, if you look at someone and you get angry with them, your good qualities go down. One is wise attention, one is unwise attention. Uh, so whenever your good qualities are increasing, it means you're using wise attention at that time. Uh, yeah? So it's about metta, compassion, giving up the bad things in life, practicing the good things. Uh, um, antidote against hindrance or doubt is just to understand more, investigate more. Huh? And against delusion itself, again, investigation. The whole path is really the antidote against delusion huh? because the whole path ends with the ending of delusion, yeah, with insight or with wisdom, if you like. Yeah. Then we have the last question for tonight, which is from Canada. Is it okay to do more than one meditation in one sitting? For example, can one do metta followed by anicca, followed by foulness of the body? Thank you. Um, yes, you can do that, but uh, be careful. Uh, and if you are going to do that, be very clear about what you are going to do before you start. Uh, you don't want your mind just to randomly move on because then you have no structure to your meditation. Uh, so if you're going to do, say, foulness of the body, I would start with that because that kind of gets the defilements out of the way. So you do that for 10 minutes yeah, or for a suitable amount of period. Then you can do the metta the, because that gives rise to the good qualities. So first you abandon the bad qualities. Then you do the metta to give rise to the good qualities. Uh, and then you can do something like watching the breath. Yeah? And then maybe after watching the breath, uh, if you want to do at the little bit of at the very end, uh, you can do the contemplation of impermanence of anicca because that is usually the time when you can have uh, more insights when you are nice and peaceful. Uh. Okay, everyone, nice to see you all again today. So let's end up, as usual, paying respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha.